America is currently winning a war that it's not fighting in. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the US has shown no indication of becoming an active player in Europe's largest conflict since 1945. However, this does not mean that the war has not and does not continue to benefit Washington. This is a graph showing anti-Russian sentiment throughout both Latin America and the West across the last 20 years. You can see a definitive spike at the culmination of 2022, emphasizing an increase in anti-Russian attitude coinciding with Putin's invasion. For the US, the true significance of these attitudes is the impact that they have on their own opinion ratings around the world. This impact can be defined by the examination of one thing, hegemony. More specifically, geopolitical hegemony. If you don't know what hegemony is, then simply put, it's the assertion of leadership and dominance by one group. Global society is characterized by competing hegemonic nature, in which superpower states compete to be the global hegemon. This spot has been continuously filled by the US since the end of the Cold War and collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The US's hegemony has gone unchallenged for a very long period of time, making them the global dominator. But in the last decade, the US has come to face challenges to this position from increasingly powerful states who are unhappy with an American-dominated world order, most prominently from China. You so much as watch or read the news at the moment, and it's difficult to avoid them. Aside from Beijing, the other main challenger to the US in recent years has come from Moscow. Russia completely rebuilt itself into verging on superpower status following the collapse of the USSR. Moscow's influence in the last decade became undisputedly global, through mechanisms such as its vast energy resources to its open involvement in various conflict zones around the globe. Not to mention Moscow's legitimate and non-legitimate involvement in Western politics, which has fueled a recent wave of Euroscepticism in Europe, and seemingly played a starring role in securing the election of the Putin-friendly Donald Trump as US President in 2016. In fact, Russia's rise posed a greater threat to the US than China does presently, as Russia's tactics have been more overtly anti-US than those currently being pushed by China. By the start of this decade, Russia's influence had become so significant that the phrase New Cold War started to be applied to the relations between Washington and Moscow. For Washington, the main problem when dealing with Russia was that in this competition, the rules for both sides were different. We can all agree that America is seen as being the pillar of the West, and therefore must uphold liberal westernized values such as democracy, law, and justice. Meaning that any US action to try and limit Moscow's influence had to and still has to align with such values. Even though we both know that in action, it doesn't always happen of course. But the US must also always appear to be respecting the wills and desires of international organizations, such as the UN. For Russia, the same rules never applied and seemingly still don't. To Russia, rules and international laws are optional. Instead of what can we do within international guidelines, it was and still is a case of how many rules can we get away with breaking. Involvement in Syria is just one of many scenarios where the US has been limited in their actions, whilst the Kremlin has had relatively free reign. At the same time, Putin was increasingly certain that the power and more significantly the harmony of the West was breaking apart, leading to a belief that repercussions for combative Russian actions in the international arena would be minimal. You can't forget either that evidence also suggested that Moscow would be able to handle the fallout of its actions with ease, as its previous military interventions within its neighbor's territory had all concluded with little lasting impact. Just look at Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, for example. It was significantly condemned, yet sanctions were limited and not long-lasting, with Russia itself not facing any long-term ostracization from the international community, being allowed to continue with hosting important global events like the 2018 FIFA World Cup. Now, Putin's essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians in July 2021 earmarked the warning that the Western world must not interfere with or act upon the increasing pro-Western sentiment in Ukraine. But it was taken as a bluff by both the US and the West, who continue to support Kiev's aspirations for accession to both the EU and NATO, believing that the significant Russian troop presence along Ukraine's border was simply a show of strength and intimidation. This is despite Putin not having a record of bluffing about such interventions too. And in the end, February 24, 4th, 2022 is now known as being the start of Putin's war in Ukraine. However, it's now also being referenced as the start of something else, Russia's demise. You see, up until the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the varying pretexts to Russia's interventions in neighboring sovereign countries had at least to an extent been ratified. Just look at the cases of Crimea and Georgia. With Crimea, the argument that it was historical Russian territory was somewhat accepted, whilst in the Georgian intervention of 2008, the pretext of ethnic minority preservation was sympathized with. Now, however, there's little sympathy and understanding for the current intervention's pretext. 
support for the supposed denazification, which is the motivation behind Moscow's latest invasion, is close to non-existent because the claim can be dismantled very easily on a factual basis. Even those traditionally allied with the Kremlin have shifted from positions of outright support to those of a more neutral stance. This lack of substantial pretext meant that for the Kremlin, victory and the taking of Kiev in a fast and effective manner was critical to the invasion being successful. And this was the outcome many analysts predicted, but one which never came to be. And those at the top of American security and foreign policy knew this, as following Russia's Ukrainian interventions of 2014, Washington signed an agreement with Kiev on the matter of security assistance. You see, since 2014, the US has provided over $39 billion worth of security assistance to Ukraine. This has transformed its armed forces from a 130,000 strong group, entirely inadequate to deal with a large-scale Russian invasion, to being a group of 470,000 high-skilled soldiers in the space of just seven years. However, these investment decisions were not made solely for charitable reasons. While it's true that all this American investment had strengthened Ukraine, its most significant attribute to Washington was its capability in potentially weakening Russia should a future invasion come. This can be summarized best in one word, proxy. Put simply, a proxy is when one thing actually represents something else. In this case, the strengthening of the Ukrainian armed forces via American training and funding has allowed them to become a proxy for the US's ambition of weakening Russia. As I said before, for the invasion of Ukraine to be a resounding success for the Kremlin, it had to take Kiev quickly, allowing minimal time for a response from the West, which in turn would have a minimal period in which Russia would be fighting both on the literal military front and facing crippling sanctions on the home front. However, Russia messed it up. They miscalculated and were grossly underprepared to face the Ukrainian armed forces of 2022, additionally making significant strategy errors at the start of the war. These were miscalculations and errors swiftly pounced upon by the US, who recognized that an attritional war could serve to tame and potentially kill the Russian bear in the long run. This is precisely how America is currently winning the war in Ukraine without actively fighting in it. The US has given significantly more financial and military backing to Ukraine than any other state, even significantly more than the entire EU combined despite the increased geographical threat posed to European states. This is not a diminishing trend either, as Washington for the time being has vowed to continue its large-scale support. This is most likely because of the devastating impacts continued US funding into Ukraine is having on Moscow. See, war is an immensely costly affair. Therefore, the longer it goes on for, the more it costs. Estimates show that Putin's invasion is costing the state $67 billion a year, representing about 20% of the Kremlin's average annual budget for the entire federation. This means the Kremlin's spending has been sacrificed in other important areas in order to finance the war. However, this still isn't solving Russia's issue of decreasing military resources in technology and personnel. Another area Russia is weakening in and the US are capitalizing on by supplying more updated weapons to Ukraine. Additionally, Russia's economy has been gradually shrinking since the outbreak of the invasion and application of heavy sanctions. Not to mention the mass migration which has also had a significant economic, demographic and military impact on Russia's overall power and influence. It has recently been estimated that the fallout of Russia's war against Ukraine will set the state back 30 years in its development. This is precisely the reason that the US has continued and will continue to pour billions into funding Ukraine's fight. You see, the trends show that as long as Russia is engaged in attritional war, it will continue to erode its own power and influence. A fact demonstrated most prevalently by a circulating belief at the start of the year that suggested Russia could become a failed state by the year 2030. Now, this type of prediction is still highly unlikely to occur, but the fact that it's being discussed at all shows just how far Russia has come in two years since its listing as the second most influential state in the world. And Russia's decline due to the US funding of Ukraine isn't the only benefit to Washington's world police status. Due to the nature of global affiliations and allegiance, the decrease in pro-Russian sentiment has only served to increase pro-Western and pro-US sentiment. This has materialized itself in both opinion polls of states which, prior to the war, held strong to moderate pro-Russian views and also in the distinct increase in desire to join Western institutions such as NATO and the EU, both of which have been continuously labeled by Moscow as mere extensions of American power. And essentially they are, as no two organizations represent Western values in continental Europe more. Within the last year, NATO has gained one European member in Finland, while Ukraine, Georgia, Bosnia and Sweden have all formalized their desires to join the organization. The story is the same with the EU, as both Ukraine and Moldova have been formalized as candidate states. All of these developments increase support for the West and the US, and in the cases of Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, they further erode Russian influence. It's also well known that war can be extremely profitable for states not directly involved in conflict. Look at this cartoon. In the simplest way, it shows the impact that the war has had on the US's military-industrial complex, which has seen a boost of around 50%. 
Washington has also seen its power grow in the energy markets as a result of the war. Heavy sanctions on Russian energy have caused European states to source their petroleum and gas from US providers, at a cost 40% higher than that previously offered by Russia. This both boosts America's economic power while stunting that of Moscow. There is no question that the war in Ukraine is working wonders for Washington's agenda, with regards to both crippling the Russian state and bolstering its own international support. And so its continued financing only makes sense. Should the US start to significantly lower its financial and military support for Ukraine, the state of the war could quickly change, as the Ukrainian armed forces are now heavily reliant on it. US withdrawal could lead to fast advances and potential victory for Russia, which would allow for the Federation as a whole to return to a state of peace. While this wouldn't reverse the damage already done to Russia's global image and development, it would go some way to allowing Russia to preserve itself from further decay. But this is a scenario the US wants to avoid, as this would still allow the possibility of a Russian rebuild under its present guise, and more significantly, under Putin. Washington wants to maintain its hegemony, whilst simultaneously securing support for the West. The best way for it to do this? Continue to pour billions into the war in Ukraine. Thank you for watching.